Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Glenn Kaiser. I'm the director of the Dolby Institute, and we've got a special two-part episode for you today, uh, focusing on the sound nominees, and this specific conversation is about the work done on First Man. So this is a conversation that we had a couple of months ago at Sony with the sound editorial team and the uh, composer and the picture editor participating. And then in part two, we're going to have a more specific kind of in-depth conversation uh, with Mary Ellis, who is the production sound mixer on the film and is nominated for an Academy Award. So enjoy this special two-part episode. Thrilled to have this extremely large panel uh, to talk about First Man, uh, which just opened yesterday. So I've got just a couple of process questions, and I'd like to start with Tom. Um, you know, as as the picture editor, um, how you know? Can you talk a little bit about your approach with Damien? Because you've worked with Damien before. Um, what's your approach to, um, to to sound design and music? At what point do you start to draw the rest of the team into the conversations? And how are you using those elements while you're putting your cut together? Um, when I'm working with Damien, I worked with him on La La Land, I worked with him on Whiplash. Um, we tend to draw on those resources immediately. So, um, and I know Justin can speak to this too, but you know, when I started picture editing, which was exactly the same time they started shooting, um, I already had some animatics that were created uh, for the big action scenes. And the, and the animatics had Justin's music um, there already. Justin had been working on the music uh, with Damien uh, well before pre-production. So a lot of the cues were already there, and I implemented them immediately. And there was also some rough sound, not from Eiling or Millie, uh, but there was some rough sound that Damien had kind of cobbled together, things that he liked um, that I tried to implement and work in. Um, so I had those things to start with, but also, you know, um, Eiling had kind of scoured uh, the script, and I had already a lot of recording of effects uh, were done um, during dailies and um, some of these things were recorded uh, I think Frankie went out and recorded a ton of stuff and I Ling recorded a ton of stuff as well and everything would kind of filter through I Ling and then um, she would pass them to me so I had I kind of had these guys built a library for me of of sounds and a lot of those things were um, Foley type things like suits um, air going through the helmets I mean everything everything kind of imaginable uh, more more stuff than I even knew what to do with um, but it also included you know like a SpaceX launch and um, uh, actual uh, Apollo launches and different different things that, that had to do with the spacecraft and so when I started picture cutting, I had all of this stuff to begin with, and um, I tried to put a lot of that stuff into my first cuts. And, um, and even while they were shooting and while I was first putting stuff together, there were a couple things I remember sending to Ai Ling. Um, one thing in particular was a scene uh, that we called the multi-axis trainer where Ryan Gosling is strapped into this weird gyroscopic-looking um, contraption. And uh, I think that was the first scene that we passed off. It was just an early cut to um, Ai Ling, and, and she did a pass on that. And that's something that we put back into, we cut on, I cut on Avid, and we put that back into the Avid. And uh, I immediately started working with it. And once shooting wrapped and Damien joined, um, that process continued and kind of amped up. So as soon as Damien and I would get a picture cut done um, or close, we'd send it to Ai Ling and she would do a sound pass on it. Um, and, and then that started to extend to Millie where we would have dialogue related stuff um, that we would send to Millie. And uh, I think an early thing we sent to Millie was a scene that was recorded in the rain uh, with some practical rain, which was, which was very challenging and problematic. And uh, so we would send things like that over to Millie and she would you know, work on it, clean it up and uh, give it back to us. So very early on, um, I was working with elements from from these guys, but then also um, we were just having kind of a, a, a back and forth, like a turnover, and we would just cycle through back and forth um, a lot, constantly. And this just continued all the way to the end. 
So uh, one of the things that we were talking about before we started, uh, Frank and 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 Tom, uh, um, I'm sorry, John, what, you guys didn't actually do. There were no temp mixes on on this film. So usually that's a time to kind of experiment and rehearse some ideas and sort of get a feel for what the director wants to do. But you didn't have the benefit of any of that. So uh, can you talk a little bit about like how did you you know? And this was your first time working with Damien. So how did you kind of approach that? you know, just jumping in and mixing the film. Uh, it is difficult not having temp dubs, but at the same time, it kind of lets you expand as you go. Uh, what we did do was went to one of the early previews so we can let it sort of sink in. And, you know, for the next couple months, you get to think about it. It's like, okay, what's, what's going to change, first of all, music, knowing that the music is temp, but knowing that the final mu music is probably going to be very close to that. And, but then it changes, you know, as it did on this one, where it just kind of changes and gets better and bigger and, you know, all of those things. But um, it gives you a chance to think in your own mind, okay, how can, how can we make this better and carry it forward? Um, in this case, it was like, uh, it, it, should, it should sort of be documentary. That was the main word that we talked about. Luckily, we had the chance of, uh, of Tom and Damien their cutting room was right next to the Hitchcock. So for lunch, pretty much every day for months, we got to see him. So once we thought of something, we could ask questions, you know, and sort of elaborate on things that we were thinking. And they would go, yeah, that's cool, go for it. Oh yeah, that's great, cool. Always very supportive or like, nah, maybe not, maybe not on this one, next one and something like that. So in a way, we, we got to really have time to think about it way before we got to the stage, before I started Dialogue pre -dubs way before we so we had a lot of the answers a lot of the directions sort of hammered out so then it was pretty much the normal getting on stage and you know having new elements tons of new elements you know the new music of course that's the first time anybody's really hearing the the fresh score and the differences in the nuances you know is the harp a you know what kind of pluck is it you know i, I mean just little tiny things that we would spend time on to make sure we got it exactly fit in. So it was, uh, I, I, would, I would say it was, it was, um, I dug it, I totally dug it. I mean, the no temp thing was new for us, but I totally dug it, it was a lot of fun. So a uh, question for you, Justin, can you talk a little bit about, about, I mean, obviously you've known and worked with Damien Chazelle, the director, for a very long time. You, we were just talking, you guys went to college together, you worked on sort of his first kind of project, which you guys started together in college, and then obviously through Whiplash, and then, uh, uh, you know, La La Land, and, and now um, uh, First Man. So what's your process for working with Damien? And uh, so apparently you, you did some pre-score sketches for the initial animatics? Yeah, so uh, I started working with Damien when he started prepping the movie. So that was March of 17, and he started shooting it in October of that year. So we had, he was like any director, working several months with the whole team, the costume production designer, cin cinematography, um, and um, Linus, the cinematographer. And um, so during that time, I was just doing my work of figuring out the themes, composing at the piano, figuring out after we sort of locked down some melodies, then figuring out the sounds of the score. And then actually, once that was figured out, actually building mock-ups to scenes. Like Tom had mentioned, there were some big scenes of the movie that Damien really wanted scored before he shot it. Obviously, that score changed once you get to post, and I'm seeing how they're cutting it, and I'm having to adjust a lot. But I think it, it's a little bit because of the background we had in making musicals um, for something like any musical, really, you have to have a lot of music actually recorded before you shoot it. And for something like La La Land, there are big sequences like the the waltz in the planetarium or the epilogue sequence where you have to have big pieces of music made so you can actually shoot to it and choreograph to it. And obviously this wasn't a musical, so that didn't have to be done the same way. But I think Damien was, he still liked approaching it, some of the scenes in the same way where he would go in knowing what the music was, he could storyboard to the music as he did with musicals, he could have it on set, he could play it for the actors at times, he could, um, and then uh, Tom and Damien could use it as the basis for their first cuts and could, um, so there are certain sequences like the the landing sequence where there was a big, there was a mock-up that was all in, it was, it was made, and I adjusted it later, but they started with that. A um, couple of other big, big sequences in the movie like that where I had really a, f a full orchestral 
mock-up. Um, and then there w was also just, uh, because I had done so many demos and so many just experimentations with themes and sounds and and arrangement and inst instrumentation ideas, we just had like a big folder of material that they used as temp to draw from. So I didn't even know how it was gonna be used. There were just a lot of different harp, harp and theremin, harp and ambience, uh, some affected strings, just lots of different ideas, implementations of the melodies that we had decided on that uh, they just had a big folder and they used that in those first cuts it, or really for a long time as they were cutting the movie. And so it would, I would get stuff from them. They would, they would cut a scene, they would drop in a demo that they thought felt you know, like temp music, but it just happened to be our temp music. They would drop it in, and then I would get it, and I would see, oh, I see what you're going for there. Let me respot it a little, little. Let me, you know, I think maybe the chords can fall a little differently against the picture, but if it would give me an idea of what they wanted, it was temp music. So I'd say, oh, you want a harp thing there? You want a, a violins thing there? So it was really helpful. Cool. Um, so we've got a couple of clips, and I'm, I'm going to presume because the movie just opened yesterday that most people haven't had the benefit of seeing it yet. Um, but before we roll into this first clip, uh, Eileen and, and, and Mildred, I wanted to ask you, so the, the documentary is a term that I'm hearing a lot with you guys talking about the film, and it seems like that was sort of a, a very important um, design approach to the film. So before we watch this first clip, can you talk a little bit about how what that meant for you on the sound effects and the dialogue side and how that uh, influenced your approach? Well, um, for the sound effects side, um, the documentary feel for me uh, is to have this grounded, greedy feel to it, um, that it shouldn't be too polished sounding. And so um, a lot of the Earth scenes, you know, they are more of the intimate, personal moments between Neil, the astronauts, and know his family so for the you know the backgrounds and the uh, foley and effects that we did um, basically we um, tried to attempt to give it a you know a more of a grounded gritty feel you know and so also in the mix you know we have a narrower mixed field and um, also you know we have Can't to we, I want to follow up on yeah. what you just said what do you mean a, a narrower mixed field um, it's basically you know in the mix when we when we do it you know um, the panning, it's, it's just, uh, the image is just narrower because um, later on, you know, in a few of the uh, set pieces, um, we needed to open it up and surround the audience. So you wanted contrast. Yeah, we wanted the contrast. And so, you know, with that, and then so, um, ironically, you know, we needed to contrast that um, in some of these uh, cockpit scenes um, so that it's more immersive and visceral to give you a feel of danger when they are going up to space, you know, from Neil's perspective. Um, so um, for us, you know, that's that. Yes, and for me, I had to, um, my, my approach on this film, because we wanted to have this documentary feel, it, the, the dialogue, the production sound had to, s had to sound the way the film looked. So in the film, it's shot in Super 16, so there's a lot of grain, and you kind of wanted that same feeling to the production sound. So I normally, on a lot of films, I will spend a lot of time really cleaning it up, um, using uh, lav mics instead of the mix channel, just to get a, a you know more a stronger signal, things like that. And um, but this approach, we wanted it to sound more like it was in a real world environment. So so for example, some scenes we would they, um, they Tom would cut with the mix channel, like for example, Mission Control. That was everybody was miked. Um, it was a huge scene with you know I don't know how many channels like twenty. It was like twenty four. Uh, I had twenty four tracks of audio because right. I think they miked every man in the mission control. Every single person had their own mic, and then when um, uh, so normally when you would sh cut a scene like that, you would just use all those ISO mics, but we ended up. Um, presenting that and then it got kicked back and then it's because it wasn't um, documentary enough because it was too clean too clean yes <laughs> so then we then then I worked with Susan Dawes a really great dialogue editor and and so it was like picking and choosing okay well we'll leave the mix channel here but then these specific lines will go in for the ISO mic so it was a different approach it wasn't your typical Hollywood soundtrack but we obviously wanted people to understand what they were saying 
but, but feel more the, Damien kept saying we want to hear and see and feel life. So life being like paper rustling or, or you know, the, the sound of the reflection in the room, things like that. I'm um, sorry, just add one more thing. Um, uh, so the other thing about this is also, um, because it has this documentary feel to it, we want it to be as um, authentic as we can. So uh, we try to add as many original and authentic sound recordings that we can. And, and also meanwhile, you know, um, sometimes in some of the moments um, during those set pieces, um, we want it to go into the emotional feeling of being in it, of uh, feeling inside um, Neil's head space. So, uh, so sometimes we ha may have to embellish it with something not so authentic or not so usual. But um, so sometimes what I do in processing some of the sounds is to uh, introduce some like distortion or um, uh, over modulation to the sounds. So it has this. Um, just this 3D feel that it just sticks to what you see on screen. Well, why don't we take a listen? Um, so this is a this is a first clip, and I I believe this is one of um, Neil Armstrong's first test flights, um, and, and this sequence is from pretty early on in the film. <laughs> a nice gentle landing. <laughs> Um, Tom, one of the things that I noticed uh, uh, watching the movie, and then it just struck me again um, in that sequence, uh, you, you play a lot of this movie in close-ups. It's claustrophobic. It's really tight. Um, and uh, you know, I think you know, I'll, it's a very different approach than maybe what we're used to seeing, sort of like wide shots, establishing scale. It has a very emotional you know, feeling. And I think you lean, you end up leaning on sound in order to build out the rest of the world that's outside the frame. But can you can you, can you talk about about that approach yeah. and why why you guys made the film in this particular well, way visually? Right. Yeah. I mean, the you know, Damien, uh, I think was very aware of a lot of uh, space movies and science fiction movies that had come before, and he's fans of of, of a lot of those. And uh, uh, I mean, I think when you think of the quintessential kind of sci-fi space movie, you think of 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is so futuristic and so space age. And uh, something that Damien really loved about the subject matter of First Man was, uh, was um, digging into the archival NASA footage, which was often shot by astronauts in 16 millimeter. And he just loved the gritty feel of that. And and felt like we could tell our story this way and felt like uh, that might help make our story more intimate and more personal. Um, and that was a big goal because, um, you know, a lot of people are familiar with the iconography. A lot of people are familiar with Neil Armstrong as an icon. And so he figured the only point in making the movie would be as if we could tell a very personal, intimate story. Um, so he was inspired by this NASA archival footage and thought, wow, wouldn't this be great if we could tell a story uh, where it would feel like we took a 16 millimeter documentary cameraman and put them into a space capsule and then shot them off into space. So, you know... Uh, in, in, in Dolby Atmos. In Dolby <laughs> Atmos, exactly. So, he, you know, his, his big directive for us was to make these, uh, you know, be a fly on the wall with the family, um, like a Cinema Verite documentary. Um, but also uh, not only be a fly on the wall in the space capsule, but have the space capsule scenes somehow be immersive and have it almost be like a, a VR experience. He really wanted to um, put the audience in the capsule and show them how these capsules were more like submarines or tanks. They were more machine age than space age, you know? And in that way, the hope was that the audience would really feel how dangerous and how risky these missions were. So. It was um, really important to Damien to um, lean into the subjective. Uh, and so in, from the picture side, he shot a lot of uh, point of view shots, um, a plethora of point of view shots, and a lot of shots of our, of, of our actors and their eyes looking at things and experiencing the world. And, and on this film, you know, Damien really wanted to do something we hadn't really done in the same way for La La Land and Whiplash, and that was he wanted my picture editing to kind of make room for sounds and stuff like that. So that's something new that we did on this film that was different from what we had done before. So 
Um, that meant that, you know, uh, I would set up a, a pictorial edit where, you know, we would see the rivets in the ships. I would have cutaways of gauges and rivets and the, the walls of these tiny capsules. And that would be the place where we'd say, okay, this is where we're going to have Ai Ling's amazing sound of the creaks and the groans of the ship. And then we're going to answer that with, um, you know, with the, the looks on the faces of the astronauts, you know, feeling the anticipation or feeling the, the, a sense of dread in some cases um, that they're about to be launched. But, you know, it, it was something where Damien really wanted to um, play around with the sound and play around with contrasts. And so, you know, it was all about, you know, building up the sound and getting the audience um, used to tiny minutia, like little creaks um, in the craft when they're getting buckled into the craft. And uh, then in one moment, hearing the, the sound of a house fly that somehow gets into the capsule, and you really focus on that. And then moments later, we have a countdown, and then, we, then, then the sound gets completely insane because we go into a launch where um, it's completely dependent on on what sound is doing. Um, and it, in pictorially, it goes into abstraction, but it's the sound that really tells the story. And so Damien really wanted to lean into that. I'm really glad that you, you, you mentioned that because, uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that I've learned uh, in this business is that great sound design moments don't really happen by accident in post-production. Um, they're, they're thought about that way at the script stage, they're shot that way, they're edited that way, because as you say, you have to give room for those moments to happen. So Eileen, can you talk a little bit about the sound design in this particular sequence? Because I'm hearing a lot of really cool abstract stuff happening, especially with the sounds of the, uh, of the, of the ship. So not to give away any of the secret sauce, but like what, uh, how, how, did, how did you, how did you uh, uh, make this, uh, this X-15 experience? Because obviously most of us have never been in an X-15 at 175,000 feet, yeah, right? Me neither. <laughs> Uh, but uh, thanks. Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, the X-15 is like the first opening sequence in the movie, just throws it right in it. And um, um, a lot of it is, um, you know, early on in the early conversations with Damien, you know, one of the film references he told me to look, to watch was uh, Das Boot for the space travel. And um, so, you know, they are basically, you know, shooting up into the sky, you know, in this like fragile spacecraft that like it's dangerous and hostile environment. Um, and so for the X-15, um, um, we wanted to be as authentic as we could. Um, um, but sometimes we need to go into something more uh, emotional to give you that sense of unease and surprise. Uh, and so, um, you know, early on on the uh, ascent, um, the X-15 is basically like a rocket, but looks like an aircraft. So during the ascent, we have like uh, rocket um, sound and you know some engine sounds that uh, ascend up. And um, when it breaks through the atmosphere, you know, we try to introduce some of the um, recordings that we made. Uh, they were recorded um, from SpaceX, the Falcon Heavy launch. Um, with the actual sonic booms. And um, by the time he gets through the atmosphere, um, um, because we wanted to create this sense of unease and surprise, we just like built, it, built the sound up uh, to play with dynamics. And so we just built it up into like extremely loud moment and just immediately drop it into like a quiet moment. And that's when you, know, you see the Earth's horizon and then Justin's music comes in. Um, but you know, in order to build it up, um, because Damien wants it to be really intense and surprising and like really like um, visceral, and so he would say things like, you know, try and surprise me. Um, and so um, one of the things that you know they try also in the picture added is uh, the introduction of like um, animal sounds. Um, so we just took that idea and. You know, used sounds of like elephant, uh, elephant roars, lion growls, even like animal stampede that builds up to the moment when he turns off the X-15. Um, um, so um, the uh, other thing is, um, 
because they are in these tight enclosures, we want to give it this um, tight, closed space, turbulence, sense of turbulence, shakes and rattles. So uh, one of the things that we did, and then we tried to record a bunch of other things, but I was trying to, um, uh, one of the things I recorded were um, some uh, motion simulator rides when the machine, uh, when it injects low frequencies to like heavily shake the entire vehicle or vibrate the entire vehicle. And also a lot of the metal creaks and groans were made by our um, Foley walkers, Dan O'Connell and John Cucci. And, uh, but basically, you know, the, mo the sequence that you just saw when he activated the thrusters and all that, you know, um, they were some of the thrusters that like we went out to record um, at, at a small um, rocket company in Mojave Desert. Um, they, were de they were developing like lunar landers. So we recorded some of the thrusters there so we were able to use it here. Um, and so as he's like f trying to fight and cut through the atmosphere, Damien was like, I want it to be like really mean and angry. And so, um, yeah, so I um, happened to um, find this like set of recordings from this one guy. Um, it was like a crowdfunded li sound library um, of like elephant recordings out in Thailand. So, um, so I just like took those elephant growls. Ang angry elephant became angry at yes, 15. Yes, yes, <laughs> and, and uh, put them through like some um, like uh, decapitator, um, the sound toys part plugin, just, and some of the explosions, just to give it like this really over-modulated, angry vibe to it. Amazing. Justin, can you talk a little bit about, so this documentary approach and the, the visually, the aesthetics of this claustrophobia and a lot of the things being shot in close-up. So with that emphasis on reality, how did that affect the music? And what is it, you know, it's an interesting music for a documentary approach. How did you handle that? Yeah, th that took the most trial and error, figuring out how to incorporate music, but have it be, um, a really, really light touch, not get in the way. Um, it's funny because the movie kind of has two facets to it. It has that really grounded documentary style, and then it has a lot of scenes mostly in space where it's 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 grand and it's supposed to be kind of a spectacle. So the music had to do kind of both things, and it had to be on both sides of that. Sometimes the music is sweeping and very much out front, and, and then other times, mostly in the domestic scenes, it had to be very quiet and intimate. Um, and but we had wanted it to all feel of a piece, um, like it was the same score. So we kind of knew how to score the big scenes. It was the little scenes that you're talking about, which were the really hard ones. So we we tried to settle on. We had the, we had them themes done, you know, early on. We knew what those were, but then it was mostly an, an issue of instrumentation, and um, just figuring out ways to orchestrate it so that it could be very, very light. And we found the harp was uh, really a key to a lot of it. Um, because a harp, it it decays really quickly. It's gentle. We had, so, um, whereas in space, we it was a lot of full orchestration, strings and brass and theremin and, and things that really sustain on Earth. We wanted it to decay really quickly. So we it basically left us with, what are those options? It's piano, guitar, harp, you know? Those are the instruments that have really light touches. And we, we had sort of thrown out piano as an option. We didn't want a piano score and guitar didn't really make sense. So we settled on the harp. Um, the harp has a lot of fragility, a lot of vulnerability that really seemed to fit um, the style of the camera style, the really sort of unsteady, fragile um, sort of uh, frames and the and as well as Neil's character and um, and uh, and then found other ways to sort of when there were other orchestral elements like strings to to f filter them through. I, we put them through a rotor cabinet to again thin them out and give them a little bit of grit that f felt um, like it matched the 16 millimeter or like the film stock. Um, putting it through some analog gear, the rotor cabinet to give it this sort of shaky, gritty feel. And then a lot of it really is 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 the mix, and it was what what John and, and these guys did at at the end, finding the the place it sits. Um, and it was really. All those temp, uh, all those fa friends and family screenings and preview screenings that we did just with the Avid, it was 
one of the biggest challenges was just figuring out where the music could sit in those domestic scenes in a way that it wouldn't stand out. And I struggled with it. Tom struggled with it. It was really a challenge. And then, you know, John did his work and, and had it sit. And it really, really transformed the score and the whole reaction to the score and the whole reaction to how the music was playing in the movie through all those intimate scenes um, because it was such a delicate balance and it, and it really took such a fine touch. And, um, and also uh, not just where it sits as, a, as an overall level, but where it peaks out. I mean, there's this one, it's the last scene of the movie and I won't g give away too much about it, but it's this very um, intimate scene between uh, Neil and Janet and the music had to, it, it, it had to enter almost invisibly and, and and then John brought it up at this moment, and right at that moment, it just highlights the emotion of the scene, and it doesn't get in the way. It's still such a verite. It's shot, and it feels so documentary, but this one little move in the music, it just it, it made the emotion tenfold, um, and that's not a move we had. That was something that um, they found, you know, in the final mix of that scene, so... It's a great last scene, not to give it away. Um, we've got we've got another clip. Um, let's take a look at this. Uh, I think this is um, Neil testing the um, the landing uh, uh, the lunar landing module. Uh, one of the things that I think you guys, as a team, did so well is is use contrast uh, in the film, and and obviously there are these big huge moments, and then. Uh, suddenly things just really die away and you can just hear some breath and it's that that modulation really engages the ear and keeps keeps it really really uh, interesting so i thought that was just fantastic um frank and john can you talk a little bit about how you used atmos uh, in, in the mix this was a native atmos mix from the beginning um yeah we um we mixed in the hitchcock theater um and eileen and i were going through premixes we never kind of the gauge is never Cross the gimmick line for the sake of Atmos. Um, we benefit from bass extension into the into the surrounds. So we really kind of just kept it to key moments when it meant something or you can actually hear it. Um, I think the first time we really kind of extended out was in the multi-access trainer. Um, so that stuff kind of moved through the array um, really well. So it lent itself that particular scene lent itself to filling the overheads to showcase the, at that moment. Um, throughout the piece, I think it was really just far and few between. Man, it sounds like, the, uh, sounds like one of the ships coming apart. <laughs> so virtual reality is its finest, monaural. <laughs> um, so we really kind of just picked and, and chose what would go into the array and at most the overheads and, and how those... Um, and how it affected the film and the, and the tone and the emotion. If it was that particular sequence was very scary, I want to give anything away, it was pretty scary, uh, what they had to go through in training. And then um, we did some stuff early on with the X-15 and some of the movement, exterior movement, that was, was kind of fun, just some of the airs and whatnot. Um, but it was really just kind of really precise and exact and never made you go away from the storyline or the screen. So that's how we handled that. Um, one of the Atmos qualities I really like is the full range surrounds. And it works so well for this film because of all the, um, during some of these cockpit rocket scenes, it needs that size and to, to immerse the audience in it. And so I think we you know, made use of a lot of that um, during say like even the, uh, the Apollo launch or the Gemini launch sequences um, to kind of put, you know, to kind of pan some of the, um, um, uh, the rocket roars um, recordings and some of the JPL, um, acoustic chamber recordings that we did just surround the whole audience with it. And, um, and, and so that would mean, you know, even like during the Gemini uh, 8 um, mishap uh, section, um, you know, you have all the spinning sounds right. that to help sell to the audience that they are like spinning at like so many revolutions per 
second or per minute. Um, uh, we had a lot of fun, you know, playing around with picking Flying up that stuff around the room. Elements, yeah, yeah, yeah like uh, panning it you know, either you know, sideways along the walls, across the ceiling, or uh, front and back. Right, um, so. but but also importantly to your point, it's backed up by the visuals and it's it's dictated by the story. It's not just uh, kind of having fun for fun. No, yeah. no, no. Yeah. Um, I do want to go. Uh, we, uh, I want to go to audience for questions, but before we do that, I just really quick because it's so rare to have a picture editor <laughs> come to participate in these kind of conversations. I wanted to ask Tom. You know, you've got two very powerful tools at your disposal from a sound perspective. You've got music and you've got sound design. So how do you, from your perspective in working with Damien, how do you pick and choose what's going to step forward in a, in a particular moment? Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, it, I, I think that, you know, it's funny. Music is, I mean, Justin's score is, his scores are always so filled with emotion. Um, and, and I love the way John put it in terms of even the biggest cues were so very delicate. There's, there's so much nuance in these, in these cues. And um, it doesn't take much to, um, to really feel them in a way, you know? And so I think, you know, Damien is a musician too, he's a musical background. I don't, I know nothing. Uh, but I, I feel like, you know, it doesn't take much to really, um, start to feel you know the emotion from these cues and so i think we really approach them as um as as elements that we really should be very careful about overusing um and i know I, and i think justin felt the same way you know like it's there were times during our rough cut um process where maybe i think justin would even chime in i think we're i think we're using too much we're leaning too much on this or you know there's uh there's you know i think it's it's we're too wall to wall here or something so it's something that i think automatically because we know how powerful it potentially is that we really try to um hold hold back in some ways uh with it and you know uh, a lot of the set piece scenes such as the gemini 8 launch um, we knew from the beginning we're going to be very um, um, sound design heavy. You know, these were we. There were some hard decisions that Damien made early on, um, where um, he wanted the sequence to take place. Uh, I don't think I'm spoiling too much if you haven't seen it, but he wanted the Gemini Eight launch to take place entirely inside that space capsule, and he wanted it to be um, backed up by um, sound design. And there would not really be any score there. It would just be um, sound design, and um, and that's the way we tempt it. And so I mocked it up with sound effects in my LCR Avid environment, and and it was kind of a sketch, and that I think helped inform my Ling, you know, where we wanted certain peaks and valleys and things like that. But then, you know, I Ling and. Frankie and Johnny took it to this whole other level where they could actually start making it a real environment. You know, the creaks and the groans that I had just placed in there in mono um, coming through, you know, like a, a center channel could all of a sudden be placed at different parts of, of the room. Um, and they would come to life in ways that, that I just couldn't do. And I, you know, it was hard for me to even imagine. But, uh, but I think also, you know, um, because, I mean, Damien is, is, again, really great with establishing contrast. He, he feels like that accentuates things on either side. You know, if he made a decision to say the Gemini 8 is going to be very reliant on um, sound design, um, the Apollo 11 launch has to be completely different. It's going to be different pictorially. It's going to be on the outside of, of the craft mainly. It's going to be larger, epic. You'll have tons of wide shots. Um, it's going to be monumental, and that's where Justin's score comes in, where it's, it is um, backed up by amazing sound design, but um, because I know that Apollo 11 was a very important launch for Damien. I mean, I think as he always puts it, the Saturn V rocket was the lar made, you can clarify, made the largest uh, man-made sound next to an atomic bomb or something like that. And Damien kept hammering Ai Ling about that, saying, you know, but you know it's like an atomic bomb, so yeah. you have to it's do something. It's got to be big, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Even uh, during uh, pre-production, he mentioned it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think he mentioned it more than once. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, we, we knew that besides that, it would really be heavily reliant on Justin's score. And that launch in particular, we knew would be something where um, we could ride on his score. And then there were other scenes like there, the Gemini 8 um, docking sequence where there's a waltz, a beautiful um, piece that Justin made. Um, we knew that that would be extremely reliant. It would just float on his cue. It, was you a, know? it almost felt like a nice little homage to 2001. Absolutely. With a, with a little bit of Tales of Hoffman maybe thrown in, yeah. in there. It's, yeah. it's our melody, but then we orchestrated exactly like, uh, you know, the class, that's all the classical music that inspired, you know, 2001 and other things. It's fantastic. Uh, let's go to. Uh, I, there's a hand. <laughs> we'll start. We'll start with some questions from the audience. Hello, how's it going? I got to see the movie earlier this week. It was fantastic. It was insane. But um, two things that really stood out to me was the metal creaking, like the, the dangers of the ship. You really felt like one of those screws was going to pop out, <laughs> and then the busyness of the the different rooms like mission control and like the White House and the funerals. So how much of that was originally recorded and how much time did you get to record like for the metal? And then it's so hard to find good Walla. So was that all originally recorded as well? Yeah, the, um, a lot of the wallas that you hear in those scenes are were recorded on set. So Mission Control, it's almost all that we he supplemented it a tiny bit. In fact, that was one of those those areas where I added some group, and Damien's like, eh, get rid of it, <laughs> you know, because he really wanted, and, and there was plenty there, and he didn't want to overdo it. He didn't want to make it too dramatic. He wanted it to be very, very natural. So yeah, so all those guys were mic'd, so we were able to use those wallas. And at the funerals, supplemented them a little bit with some group wallas in the funerals. Um, and what was the, the other one that you mentioned? The White House was like the White House. Busy. That yeah. was mo that was all production walla. It was amazing, and and we actually then even added more of it to, 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 than was originally there. That stuff was great. So. And then for the metal, um, did you do a, a bunch of original recordings? And how much time do you have to record, like before you start editing? Um, so. Specifically for the metal, um, um, you know, a lot of it uh, for the creaks and groans and um, were, you know, uh, made by uh, Dan O'Connell and John Cucci, our Foley Walkers. Um, but um, a lot of it is also some of the intense um, shakes and stuff. Um, we kind of, you know, like I said earlier, um, we did some recordings earlier, so um, besides some of the um, Motion, um, motion simulator shakes and stuff. Um, uh, I don't, most of it, you know, uh, we didn't really record as much on the shakes and uh, on the metal creaks and groans. Um, they were like mostly from uh, some of the sound libraries, but um, sometimes we did try to uh, also uh, use sounds that's like um, um, not really like a hand shaked kind of shakes because then sometimes it can sound kind of artificial and not natural. So we had uh, some recordings of um, uh, different metal um, where, uh, you know, when you attach some kind of like bass um, vibration um, things that you get maybe in the car's boom box. Um, and you no, know, we attach them and so we have that natural shake. But um, most of them, you know, um, we are just trying to accentuate the sh the, the sharpness um, that you know if something should break that piercing sharp shakes could kind of kill you. Um, uh, you definitely got a sense that these things could come apart at any second. <laughs> it, you, you communicated very well that this was a very dangerous endeavor to be flying these aircraft. Uh, yeah, right, Thank right, you. right over here. I think they're going to bring a microphone to you. Thank you. Um, so I haven't seen the film yet, but um, from these examples and from what you guys were talking about before, my question is more uh, for Justin and Tom and your collaboration, and how um, it seems like it's it's more of an example. Um, this this movie is an example of you know music done right, where where it starts uh, early in the process, as opposed to the more traditional way of composing to the picture lock perhaps. So um, it seems like that, that's that's more and more the trend. Like uh, for example, Ludwig was uh, you know speaking about sim something similar before. So my question to you guys is what, what are the 
benefits of that, um, apart from the obvious ones of, you know, directors perhaps falling in love with temp music, but other benefits that you see in that, in that uh, uh, process. And, um, and if you see perhaps this going uh, more, you know, the process of composing music for film as kind of like building a, a, a temporary perhaps library of music beforehand of thematic material and perhaps sonic material, and then sort of finesse in that after the picture is locked. Is that the process that it seems to be happening, you know? I mean, I, uh, we, we, me, Damien, and Justin kind of continue to workflow that we had uh, started on La La Land out of necessity uh, because La La Land was a musical. We really had to, um, we're very reliant on, on Justin creating cues early on, and then we ended up using them. Um, but we did a thing where, you know, we, Justin set up a room adjoining my room and we shared a door, so we were really, um, we worked very, very closely together, and it was kind of like a, I'd say it was always like a TV sitcom where we would just, some character would just like waltz in without, unannounced. Uh, Which one of you was Kramer? And it was usually Justin, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, it's very different from other projects I've worked on where, um, where the music kind of follows or chases the picture. Um, Damien's a, mu a musician, and so he has very, a very specific point of view on, on um, how he wants to do things, and, and he has very specific musical tastes. And uh, you know, when we're working together, he'll often know a, a music edit that he thinks will work or won't work. And so we're a couple steps ahead with him in a way. And uh, I think it's very director reliant. So it's really what works for that particular director. And, but for, for Damien, um, you know, uh, it, a lot of what Justin would do would really inform the picture cutting um, and not the other way around. I mean, a, a, you know, we would certainly pass picture to Justin and he would have to kind of rework what he had done. But, um, but often... Um, you know, he would do things uh, musically that he felt were best um, for the music emotionally, and that would require some picture changes. And that, um, you know, almost always was received well by Damien and by me, and we would make some adjustments, you know. Uh, if we really didn't feel like we could make the adjustment, then we would say we can't do it. But most of the time, we would really be very open about adjusting. And um, that's not always the case when I've worked on other projects where, um, you know, I think the directive from the filmmaker is to the music is just like, just to the music editor, just make it work. You know, I don't care. I, I, you know, it doesn't, I can't tell, so it doesn't matter. But, you know, um, Damien and Justin have very sensitive ears, uh, you know, and, and so it was something where, you know, it, we would do this cycle back and forth to to make sure that that um, to make sure that you know musically and emotionally it was working, and often that meant the picture kind of followed. And in order to do that, it was it we felt it necessary to work very closely together. Um, yeah. Yeah, and before we even get to the editorial process, I need time to figure out a lot of stuff like. Uh, we, Damien and I really love melodic scores and thematic scores and just finding a melody can take a really long time and we don't want to be caught in post-production with a certain number of weeks left and still, you know, at that point you just need to score the picture and so we need to know what those melodies are before and what the what the sounds are, what the instrumentations are before so that's why we start as soon as pre-production starts. Just It took about two months of me just working at the piano, just sending piano demos to Damien. And that's been our process since the first movie we did, just emailing MP3s all day long. And, and I, I, I email one off and he says, no, I hate it. And then I, an hour later, I have another idea and I email it, no, don't like it. And so we just keep going through And then maybe there's, oh, that one's interesting. Let's explore that. Where could that go? What, what could a B section of it be? How could it unfold? experiment, go down that road, and then usually throw it out and keep going until we have uh, a main theme, and in the case of most movies, this movie, a couple of subordinate themes that we're just like really confident in, and we feel like really serve the story. So that takes a long time, and it took a couple months at the piano before we even got to instrumentation ideas, sonic ideas. Um, so I need that time. Maybe I'm slower than most. Maybe we're just more... Um, 
you know, we just we just take our time with that. And uh, and then after that, this movie was different in the, in the sense that we had to find we knew there had to be a sonic element as well because it couldn't just be an orchestra in a room like La La Land. It couldn't be a big band like Whiplash. We had to figure out a sound for it. So there were a few months of pl- getting some, like learning how to use some production stuff I hadn't learned, I hadn't used before, getting some modular synths, learning how those work, getting a theremin, learning how to play around with that. So there was, it was just took a, we just wanted to make sure that we were as prepared as possible so that when we got to post, we could just score the scenes and we weren't figuring out the big building blocks of it. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. Uh, we have to wrap this up. But uh, I really want to thank uh, Eileen and Mildred and Tom, Justin, uh, Frank, and John for coming out to uh, talk with us today about thank First you. Man.